Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. Sheriff Joe Arpaio's contempt of court hearings are set to start again. We'll talk about this as well as other developments involving America's toughest sheriff and learn about a new initiative that will help fund literacy programs and help prepare children when they start school. Plus, find out about a college preparatory program helping first-generation college students. All this coming up next on Horizonte. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you for joining us. This week, the federal judge presiding over a racial profiling case against Sheriff Joe Arpaio issued an order to resume contempt of court hearings for the end of September. Recently, the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors unanimously voted to settle a Justice Department lawsuit against the sheriff. Here to talk about this and other developments involving Sheriff Arpaio is Paul Charlton, former U.S. Attorney for Arizona and a partner at the law firm of Steptoe and Johnson. Paul, welcome back to Horizonte. We've had you on the show uh, on a number of occasions and many of them talking about uh, this matter involving Sheriff Arpaio. Um, let's talk first about the settlement. Uh, the Department of Justice had announced, what, a year or two ago that they weren't going to pursue criminal charges against the sheriff, but they would pursue a civil lawsuit and that just got settled. What was involved there? July 16, the Department of Justice and the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors entered into an agreement that said that the Department of Justice was no longer going to pursue a civil case against Joe Arpaio and the Sheriff's Office as it related to worksite enforcement, a program that's largely been disbanded, as it relates to certain language training programs. But perhaps most significantly, as it relates to allegations by the Department of Justice that Joe Arpaio had sought to retaliate against his political enemies. All three of those aspects of the Department of Justice case are no longer going to go forward. The only remaining large piece of the Department of Justice's case is that part of the case that deals with civil rights violations uh, for Hispanics here in this county. Now the first two elements uh, that, that were settled, uh, as I understand it, the DOJ's rationale was that's largely been resolved by the ACLU case, the Melendres case that's going on in front of Judge Snow. Uh, but the third one, retaliation, there didn't seem to be anything uh, of great substance that uh, explained why they would settle that part of it. And as you know, Jose, I represented one of the individuals who, uh, against whom we believe Joe R. Pyle retaliated, an individual by the name of Don Stapley. There are others, uh, Judge Gary Donahoe, individuals who believed that Joe R. Pyle had used his law enforcement authority to retaliate against them because they had taken political views inconsistent with what he wanted them to do. The loss of the ability to have that matter go to trial is a significant one because there is a salutary effect to having that evidence presented to a neutral trier of fact and for the public to see exactly what occurred there. But the Department of Justice, for reasons that they've not shared with us, has decided that they wanted to settle that aspect of the case. And uh, as I understand, the, the only thing that the settlement really addresses is, is the sheriff's promise not to re do that again. That's exactly right. The sheriff's office has said we'll no longer retaliate against individuals. No monetary fines were imposed or agreed to. The only piece, as you pointed out, that remains in place now is that aspect of the case that deals with civil rights violations. And there have been some developments there in terms of the relationship between the DOJ lawsuit, which is in front of Judge Silver, and, and uh, uh, the case in front of Judge Snow. Tell us about that interaction or what's being suggested. After about a two-month hiatus, Jose, where nothing has really happened in front of Judge Snow's court because Judge Snow was ruling on a motion by Joe Arpaio and his chief, Jerry Sheridan, uh, that had asked that Judge Snow recuse himself because of perceived bias. Uh, Judge Snow, on the 20th, this last Monday, um, held a hearing after he ruled that I, he was not going to recuse himself. Uh, Judge Snow said that uh, this contempt hearing was going to go forward that he wasn't going to stay the proceedings, even though Joe Arpaio and Jerry Sheridan said that they were going to appeal Judge Snow's decision not to recuse himself. And finally, as it relates to the Department of Justice, Jose, what the Department of Justice has sought to do now is to intervene in this other case, this case brought by the ACLU, uh, with the objective of perhaps arriving at the same outcomes in the Judge Snow case that they might otherwise achieve in the Judge Silver case. Give us a quick refresher of the basis for the allegations of bias against the judge and, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about um, uh, the judge's thinking in terms of denying the motion to recuse himself. Principally, 
Joe Arpaio and Jerry Sheridan alleged that Judge Snow exhibited bias and prejudice when he began to ask questions about two aspects of what Joe Arpaio and Jerry Sheridan had done both in the course of this civil lawsuit and just prior to the initiation of the civil lawsuit. One was an investigation into allegations that someone had overheard Judge Snow's wife state that Judge Snow had ill feelings or adverse feelings as it relates to Joe Arpaio. That was the first aspect uh, of this bias uh, allegation. The second was an odd, and I say odd in the course of a proceeding that is already unusual and odd, but an odd allegation uh, that an individual by the name of Dennis Montgomery in Seattle, Washington had in his possession CIA documents that were alleged to have been harvested by the CIA and which Dennis Montgomery offered uh, to Joe Arpaio and to the Sheriff's Office as proof that there was a relationship between Eric Holder, the then Attorney General, and Judge Snow. When Judge Snow began to question Joe Arpaio and Jerry Sheridan about these two investigations, uh, Judge, uh, Joe, Joe Arpaio and Jerry Sheridan's lawyers not immediately but some days afterwards raised concerns about the perceived bias uh, that uh, they believe Judge Snow had exhibited by asking these questions. And this was after they both admitted that there had been such an investigation. There's no doubt that such an investigation took place. Joe Arpaio and Jerry Sheridan say that the information provided by uh, Mr. Montgomery, uh, Dennis Montgomery, was worthless, essentially. Um, and they also said, or at least their lawyers did immediately after that hearing, that they weren't going to seek recusal of Judge Snow, but they've since changed their minds and now are aggressively seeking his recusal. Now, some of the things that have come out in the press, I don't know if this has actually been in any court findings, are the amounts of money paid to Mr. Montgomery and, and uh, 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 some qualms that were expressed by people in the sheriff's office about whether this was a wise thing to do and the quality of what they were getting from Mr. Montgomery, and yet they, they continue to, to pay him money. Correct. The public records indicate that there were qualms and doubts expressed by those individuals who were a part of this investigation as it related to uh, Mr. Montgomery, that they believed uh, within the sheriff's office itself that they weren't getting their value for the amount of money that they were providing to Mr. Montgomery. The sheriff's office had designated Mr. Montgomery as a confidential informant and were paying him significant amounts of money. There is, as you point out, some debate as to exactly how much money that is, but by any definition, a significant amount of money. At least $120,000. <clears> at, at least some tens of thousands of dollars, and there are at least um, some people publicly and in the media who have said it goes much higher than that. So uh, where do we expect all of this to end up? I mean, what, what's going to happen next? We know that, that uh, uh, the sheriff's office is appealing. The judge didn't give him a stay pending that appeal. Um, do you expect the Ninth Circuit to act anytime soon? The Ninth Circuit will act soon on this issue, Jose, whether or not, in fact, the proceedings before Judge Snow, and remember these proceedings now are whether or not Joe Arpaio will be found not just in civil contempt, but in criminal contempt, whether or not Joe Arpaio will have to face some period of time, perhaps in jail, for violating the judge's order. So the Ninth Circuit immediately, and I say immediately in terms of how uh, the courts rule by speed, but quickly, will have to decide whether or not they should stay, stop these proceedings before Judge Snow until they can make a ruling as to whether or not Judge Snow should have, in fact, recused himself. But as of right now, at the end of September, there's going to be a hearing uh, to determine whether or not Joe Arpaio should be found by Judge Snow to be in criminal contempt or whether or not civil contempt will be adequate. I assume uh, that the expectation is the Ninth Circuit will rule before the hearings start, because the, uh, at least on the request for a stay. I think the hope and the expectation, you're correct, by the Ninth Circuit would be that they would at least, as to whether or not to stop or stay these proceedings, will be done relatively quickly. And in any sense, and this is just the last question, uh, if the proceedings go forward, uh, are we talking weeks, months, uh, and, and, and what would the scope of those proceedings be? Do you know, Jose, the uh, Joe Arpaio and Jerry Sheridan have both admitted that they were in contempt, that they violated the judge's orders. The only issue for the judge to determine now is whether or not he should refer this matter to the United States Attorney's Office for criminal prosecution because what we say in the laws of mens rea, whether or not Joe Arpaio had a guilty mind, whether or not what he was doing was something he knowingly did, whether he knowingly violated the judge's orders, and if the judge finds that to be true, there'll be a trial. 
and the U.S. Attorney's Office will have to move forward, will be asked to move forward on that trial and determine whether or not Joe Arpaio, in fact, committed a crime. So we'll have likely some decision by the judge, maybe in October, and then we'll see what, what if he decides to refer it, uh, what the Department of Justice will do. If the Ninth Circuit doesn't stay these proceedings, I think we can expect a hearing to take place at the end of September, yes. I'm sure we'll be talking to you again, Paul, to, to see what's going on. Thank you so much for joining us on Horizon. Thanks for having me, Jose. Southwest Human Development, Arizona's largest nonprofit dedicated to early childhood development, is starting a new initiative to raise funds for early literacy, which includes a children's book writing contest. Joining me to talk about books for babies and toddlers, too, is Jake Adams, Chief Development Officer for Southwest Human Development. Jake, thanks for joining us this evening. Um, Southwest has been, uh, human development has been around for a long time, um, uh, and, and of course his focus on child development has been around for a long time. But this is something new, not just for Southwest uh, human development, but nobody's ever done something like this. I've yet to find any other projects quite like this. So to give you a little bit of context, we have 850 employees, 40 programs. We serve about 135,000 children and families per year, uh, almost all under the age of five, zero to five. Each of our programs, each of those 40 programs, incorporates literacy because it's vitally important uh, and it's one of the problems we have in our community is children arriving in kindergarten unprepared with those basic early literacy skills. And so we incorporate that into each of those programs. Through that effort, we actually distribute over 100,000 books annually. So we kind of got this idea that um, some of the things that they're teaching at ASU is social ventures and why not publish our own book and so we decided to hold a manuscript contest and actually invite folks to write a manuscript for a children's book we're going to act as the publisher and hire the illustrator do all of the editing lay out the book and print it and so we're going to use that book uh, to serve the children that we work with through primarily to, through two literacy programs Reach Out and Read and Raising a Reader. So, so uh, you've got two interesting and innovative aspects to it. One is the, the contest. The other is uh, the funding. Yes. So uh, you know, we, we, we're looking for investors um, uh, through crowdfunding. And so we have an Indiegogo cam that campaign that is live right now. It started just about a week and a half ago. And we're halfway to our $10,000 goal. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. We've gotten to engage with a lot of folks, and uh, it's it's an opportunity for folks who maybe aren't writers but like this concept and want to get involved. Um, the Indiegogo campaign gives you uh, kind of perks for uh, supporting the project. And, and this will be a way of paying the for costs for those items you mentioned, the, the publishing, the hiring an illustrator, and so forth. Correct, correct. So that will help uh, help with the costs of actually publishing the book, which it costs money to put a book out. Uh, and we're going to also have uh, fees for the manuscripts that are submitted as well. Let's talk about the contest itself. Sure. First of all, what's the deadline for submitting? A, a, so and, and what the, is it they need to submit, their proposal or their actual book? Yep. So it's the actual manuscript, 600 words or less. The deadline is September 15th, but for early birds, uh, the submission fee is only $50 uh, if you get it in before the end of August and then it goes up $25 to $75 per submission. And there are certain criteria in terms of what you're looking for. Yeah, so uh, we're looking for a book that's geared for a child zero to three. My son Oliver is 14 months old. There's a lot of different books that I read. I read uh, Dr. Seuss books that are 
comp complex and you know 40 some pages. I also read little board books that are six or seven pages. So we're really open-minded to what uh, the writer wants to write about. Um, but we use the exact same criteria uh, for this contest as we use when we select books. And we work with Reading is Fundamental, Riff, uh, which you may have heard of. And we've used the same criteria, and those are on the First Edition Project website uh, for any potential authors who would like to take a look at what the criteria are. And who's going to make the decision in terms of what book you select? Because I'm sure you're going to have many, many submissions. Yeah. So we have literacy experts in uh, at Southwest Human Development that are going to help with the first round. And then we have a fantastic group of final selection committee members, uh, including Dr. Kathy Short, a uh, professor at uh, University of Arizona who was on the Caldecott Selection Committee. Uh, we have one of the writers uh, for Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. It happens to be one of my colleagues uh, sisters which is terrific. Uh, and we also have uh, a guy named Todd Bowles who actually uh, founded Little Free Libraries uh, which is a really cool concept where they actually build uh, these, they kind of look like a birdhouse and people put them up in their neighborhood and they share books through them. Now the book itself will be for sale as well as being donated and used in the programs that you have? Yes, so we're going to do a, a retail sales uh, with the book. We're going to follow a Tom's Shoe model, uh, buy one, give one. So uh, we'll have these on sale uh, online and in bookstores. Uh, and when a person would buy one, we will uh, distribute a book to a child uh, that we serve. And uh, we're almost out of time, so just last question here. Uh, talk about the, the program itself. You're in four schools, and, and, and that's where you use the books. Well, so actually, we're, this is before the kids get to school. So we're actually in uh, low-income neighborhoods like um, uh, in low-income apartment complexes. We work with the Arizona Multi-Housing Association, and we do an eight-week series through our Raising a Reader program. And our Reach Out and Read program is actually in pediatric offices. So we are in 60 pediatric offices, and the pediatricians actually uh, give a book to a child during their well-child checkup. And they use that as a uh, tool to encourage the parents and actually prescribe to parents to read to their child every day. It's a great program. Thank you so much for joining us on Horizonte to talk about it. Thank you. To find out more information about what's on Horizonte, go to azpbs.org and click on the Horizonte tab at the top of the screen. There you can access many features to become a more informed Horizonte viewer. Watch interviews by clicking on the video button or by scrolling down to the bottom of the page for the most recent segments. Learn about more specific topics like arts and culture and immigration. You can also find out what's on Horizonte for the upcoming week. If you would like an RSS feed, a podcast, or you want to buy a video, that's all on our website too. Other features include our collection of website links and a special page for educators. While you're there, show your support for Horizonte with just one click. Discover all that's on Horizonte. Visit azpbs.org, Horizonte, today. Watch sneak previews of what's coming soon to 8. Go to azpbs.org slash previews today. The Upward Bound Project at ASU is a federally funded college preparatory program that serves potential low-income and or first-generation college students. With me to talk about the Upward Bound Project is Ronald Briggs, Assistant Dean of Students at ASU. Dean Briggs, thanks for joining us this Thank evening. You very much. Um, this program's been around for a long time and, and, and it's a proven success. Give us a little bit of a sketch of its history and, and, and how it's been implemented here in Arizona. Sure, so uh, very, very similar. So TRIO actually has been around since 1964. Uh, the three programs that originally started was Upper Bound, our Talent Search, as well as Student Support Services, which primarily works with students on the post-secondary level. Um, and working at Arizona State University for this particular program has been great because it, it directly aligns with university's mission in regards to uh, recognizing the students who we include and not exclude. Uh, that's, that's a great portion of it. For our Upper Bound program, I, I would say in regards to just success, um, this is a program that's really geared toward working with our high school students for uh, college preparation. So focusing on the tutoring, focusing on the college preparation things and resources that students will need in preparation for uh, going to uh, higher education. What, what age or, or grade level do you start? That's a great question. So ninth grade. Uh, for our upper bound students, so ages really 13 to about 19. So students are eligible from the age of 13 um, and f from ninth grade uh, up until um, their 12th grade year. 
And do they stay in the program? So if you have somebody who starts in ninth grade, are they there all the way through? Senior that year? is the plan, yes. And, and what is it you, you talk to these kids about? Oh, so we, there's, I think this really, what's really great is that we actually have staff that's actually in the schools working with the students from the college prepar preparedness, the uh, academic advising, uh, the actual course tutoring, uh, focusing on the science, the math, uh, the technology, uh, things of that nature that's really getting the students prepared for um, what they'll be expecting in college. Uh, another great aspect of it is that we have uh, Saturday programs which we bring the students to campus where they're getting kind of like a college course feel. Um, and then in the summertime, they're actually on campus uh, for about a month uh, where they're actually receiving, um, actually taking classes on, on campus. And we've got some pictures we've been putting up on the screen. Are, are these the kids on at ASU campus? Yes. Uh, so some of the different programs that we have on campus are um, really um, major fairs uh, that focus on really students as they're thinking about what they want to do or what they want to major in high school. And this would be what, when they're, when they're uh, juniors? Or this something? is actually for all of our students. So really the ideal goal is to have the students thinking about this at ninth grade as opposed to waiting to their 12th grade year. So what kind of interaction do they have in the high school? Do you send counselors in to talk to them? You work with the teachers? How's it done? We work with the, with the, with the staff and the faculty in the high schools as well as we provide tutors uh, for our students. Uh, so after school programming uh, that focuses in those specific subjects, so the math, the science, the writing, English. And as I understand it, um, there are only a limited number of spots that are available for students to, to get involved. Very true. Uh, so with the federal government being the fact that this is a federally funded program, we're actually funded to serve 142 students. Um, and it's a program that's really, uh, as we say, trio works because just the retention rate and the graduation rate is pretty high. Uh, we graduate just in the, in the past year, 98% uh, uh, of our students. Um, in regards to college entrance, uh, over 90% of our students who graduate, uh, they actually enroll into college. And is it 142 new participants each year, or is that the maximum you can have at any one time, all four grades? It's the maximum of, of, for the whole time. Uh, and as we expect, you know, with the expectation that we're graduating students, as those students are transitioning out to ASU, um, we want uh, to bring in more students. So spots open up by virtue of the fact that people graduate out of the program? Correct. Um, how, how do kids find out about it? I mean, how, how do you recruit them? Oh, that's a great question. So in recruitment, um, we share that information in the various programs that we have here at ASU uh, where we work with high school age students, but also the opportunity in uh, working with our targeted schools, uh, so Cesar Chavez, uh, uh, Fairfax, as well as Mary Vell and the Carr Hayden community, um, we are actually in those schools. Uh, so we're promoting the information to not only to the faculty and staff, which we get a lot of referrals to, but also to the students and the family members. So in terms of staffing, how many people do you have in the schools and what is it that they do on a daily basis? Uh, so the staff, I believe, uh, just just think off the top of my head, we have about, like, about five uh, instructors. And those instructors are the ones who are providing subject courses. Uh, so the English, the writing, the math, and the science. And, and how do you deal with, um, and we've talked about this with other guests on our show, uh, in terms of, of specifically the Hispanic population, um, particularly children of recent immigrants where um, uh, the thought of, of sending their kids to college may not be something, and, and in fact you're focused on, on first generation students so you run into this, mm -hmm. but there may be some cultural issues as well. How do you deal with that? Um, I think in regards to on the high school level, the interaction that we have with the family members, uh, there are programs where we engage the parents as well as the students, and during those times we're having the conversations of college preparedness. Uh, what are the opportunities, what are the necessarily needs, and um, data that one would actually need to prepare for college. I think that's one of the great pieces in the researches or resources that we actually have within um, ASU. Our educational outreach side does a lot of work with our uh, high school students and elementary school students and college preparedness. Um, but then as they transition to college, uh, there's that student support services program that's there, but also all the other services that are definitely within our educational outreach and student services division that promotes and provides those resources to really get students acclimated to the university. Is there any direct engagement with with the parents or is the communication solely through the students? No, there's communication with the parents. I think being the fact that uh, we are working with minor students is keeping those parents involved. Uh, so during those Saturday programs, as I mentioned before, there's opportunities where we actually invite the parents in and we're having those conversations. We put on programs specifically for the parents. So as I said, I said before, thinking about scholarships, how to search for scholarships, how to finance your education. And um, 
this is a birthday for, for some of the programs. Anyway, what, what is it, 50th anniversary? Yes, for our talent search program, yes. These are great programs. They are. And we're very grateful for you to show up and, and talk to us about it. Dean Briggs, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And that's our show for this evening from all of us here at Horizonte and Channel 8. Thank you for watching. I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good evening. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.